friends. If I were asked where South Africa is headed today, I would have to say quite frankly that I do not know. But I know that the signposts along the way caused me great concern and anxiety. I've learned over more than half a century in politics and public life the signposts must be hidden. There are some that echo what we have seen before, and there are some that appear new, but are mainly painted in different colors. We talk about signposts. I think, for instance, of the call for nationalization that continually raises its head these days. First, it was in the ANC, which raised its head, and now in the EFF. The ideology of nationalization and socialism were part of the African National Congress of my youth. And I grew up myself believing that they had value. Indeed, I twice visited President Julius Nyerere in Tanzania in the 70s. First of all, I visited him to thank him for giving sanctuary to all our exiles. And so on the second occasion, I went to sit at the feet of the master, as it were, because it was the guru of African socialism, which was called Ujama. But I discovered, ladies and gentlemen, that by then President Nyerere had had seven thoughts about Ujama. He gave me his book on dedication, 10 years of the Arusha. It was clear that he was doubting it that socialism was the answer in Africa, and had converted to the ideology of a free market economy as the best way to create jobs. I likewise became convinced of this. After President Mandela's inauguration, President Mandela paid a state visit to South Africa and requested his hosts to allow him to visit me in my office in Cape Town, where I was Minister of Home Affairs. President Yerere told me that he was present in Harare during the inauguration of Mr. Robert Mugabe as Prime Minister of Free Zimbabwe in 1980. At the time, he warned Mr. Mugabe vis-a-vis -vis the economy of Zimbabwe, and this is what he said. And I quote him. He said to Mr. Mugabe, we have inherited a jewel, referring to the economy of Zimbabwe. Don't do what I did in Tanzania. Don't destroy it. Of course, the rest is history, ladies and gentlemen, as far as that warning is concerned. I was also still in the cabinet of Mr. Chabombeni, our president. And he announced in parliament the policy of GEAR, which is an acronym for growth, for G, employment, for E, and A for N, and redistribution. Growth, employment, and redistribution. I remember, and I think that the Honorable Mrs. Zigalal will remember, that I went to the podium in Parliament and I described this as a Sardamaskin experience on the part of the ruling party. The pastors that are here know what happened to Saul when he went to Damascus. But immediately the tripartite partners of the ANC, Kosatu, and the South African Communist Party, rejected the year. We saw them on national television, and many of you may remember they were jumping up. We do not want gear. We do not want to see full gear. <laughs> so Gia gave way to Askisa. But Kosati then developed its own economic policy, as did the ANC with Nick. And we ended up with a Tower of Babel situation on a matter of very critical importance about the future of our country, the future of our children in future generations. Dear friends, 
I know that many of you will have seen me rise in Parliament over the past few months to intervene in an attempt to restore the dignity and decorum of, of the National Assembly. I've received messages of support gratitude from many quarters from leaders outside of South Africa. One of them was the head of state, which I'll not mention, but of a state in Southern Africa, who sent his ambassador to phone me and said that he was watching television and wanted to commend me for what I did in Parliament. And from ordinary patriots on our own soil. And they agree that a voice of reason is needed in our political debate. For 40 years since I founded Yuka Ata on the 21st of March 1995, I've played my role as a voice of reason. I do, not, I do it behind the scenes as well as in public. Indeed, when Ms. Malima came to see me in January last year to apologize for insulting me in the past, he said, Mrs. Zimani, he said I was in the factory fault of the AMC. <laughs> After we relaxed and had something to eat, and I spoke to him and his colleagues about nationalization and socialism because I wanted him to know that we have been there. I did so after we smoked a pipe of peace together. I related to him my conversation, which I've shared with you with President Nyerere, and pointed out that these ideologues, the other ideologies that he pursues, have been tested, in fact, in Africa, and found wanting. They have been tested in Russia, and the Eastern Bloc of countries, and were found wanting. Tested, indeed, in Germany, and indeed, East Germany was destroyed by communism. And I remember being visited when I was Chief Minister of Bosnia. by some young people from Russia. And they said they didn't want to hear anything about communism and socialism because they said it destroyed their country. When I used to pay visits to Germany, before the Berlin Wall was removed, I could see the difference between East and West Germany. It was very stark and profound. East Germany was completely impoverished. In my earlier life, my previous life as Chief Minister of Bosnia, there was often a lot of things are written and said about me, having been a steward of the government, a collaborator, and sell out. Well, let me tell you a story tonight, because I'm a witness. When we unveiled the tombstone of Mr. Tamu in Benoni, in the early 90s, Mr. Mandela was there, the whole cabinet was there, all the former leaders of the ANC were there, Sisulu, Begao, Govan Beg and others, they were all still alive. Mr. Klopas and Simandi, the father of this gentleman here, Eben Simandi, got up to speak and he departed from his speech and said that he was actually sent by Nikos Albert Utuli, the president of the ANC, and Mr. Tam to approach my sister, Princess, Princess Mojina who was married to a medical in Davidson here in Gauteng to say to her, because we as ANC were against the balkanization of the country into independent states under the homeland policy. But they said if they finally forced us to, to, to comply with that, indeed we were the last to comply, they said please, 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 they are asking me to take over that position so that we can 
destroyed the system from within. So I did that as a cadre of the ANC. And I say this in the presence of Mr. Of Mr. Okay. Now the IP is largely forgotten by the private sector. And all that we did is hardly remembered. And all that we do now is standing up to the ruling party for, for the sake of South Africa's economy. It's applauded, but it never translates into financial support for the IFP. And I cannot find the reason for that. The IFP needs financial support. Our voice needs to be strengthened if it is not to be drawn out by a populist message of a national democratic revolution of the ANC and the nationalization of mines and banks by Ms. Malima and the EFL. There's no doubt that our country's economy is in a crisis. We have not even achieved the hope for economic growth of 4.1%. And we have been surpassed by Nigeria. South Africa used to be the hub of Africa. Now that title goes to Nigeria. I wonder how the ANC's National Democratic Revolution, I don't know, which they have not unpacked what it means. But it somehow smacks of past socialist experimentation, in my view. And that is why the IFP has supported the National Development Plan of Mr. Zuma and constantly calls for its implementation. South Africa is united in supporting the National Development Plan which has come out with Mr. Zuma. All except the tripartite partners of the ANC. They are already slightly at it. They've criticized the mission development plan. And there's out now no guarantee whatsoever that the ruling party won't work under the pressure as they have done in the past and abandon the national development plan and create further uncertainty for our country and for our economy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a serious position, very serious Because we say we're a developmental state, that our economy is based on the fact that we're a developmental state. But in fact, today, as you know, 16 million people receive social grants, 16 million dependent social grants. And even Mr. Zuma, our president, has admitted that that is unsustainable, can't be sustainable. And that actually brings up the question, are we to a middle state or are we to as a welfare state? The mindset is being promoted. At least I don't know about you in counting, but in Bazuri Natal, the ANC inculcates in the minds of all people that receive this money, that money, is ANC money. In fact, one of the MECs, Michel Kadir, publicly said, anyone receiving a social grant but doesn't vote for the ANC is stealing ANC money. <laughs> Unfortunately, our people are still politically illiterate. They believe that. I'm deeply concerned, as I know that many of you are, but the direction of our country puzzles me. I don't know where our country is going. So when you see me rise in parliament and intervene, as I'm referred to, trying to restore dignity and decorum, I'm doing so on behalf of many South Africans who fear where our country is heading. But sounding one is standing at the voice of reason is only just part of what we can all do to intervene. I've intervened more than once. The last time I intervened, I tried to say, you know, people there, when the president stands up as the head of state, because I tried to promote a bill in Parliament, which I wanted to be passed as law, separating the position of the head of state to that of the head of government. 
Because we still have a titular head of state in this country too, and a prime minister. But of course, the committee, the AC members in the committee killed it. And in fact, we couldn't promote any PM because it would always be killed in the committee because of the majority of members were AC members. But of course, our late uh, member of parliament, Dr. Mario Gaspari Ambrosini, actually went to court because as members of parliament legislators and the only bills that came were those which came from the executive from cabinet. So he took this man up to the constitutional court he sued the speaker. And the constitutional court has ruled now that in fact we can initiate legislation in Parliament. The greatest intervention we make at this point, ladies and gentlemen, is to strengthen parties like the IFP throughout South Africa, in particular here in Gauteng, at local level, so that individuals like you and your families can even partner with a political party that represents your own views. The timing is good to do this for just about a year away from the local government elections where the opportunity opens to get the IFP to municipal council in Gauteng. Mr. Our host, Mr. Sahizi, was our councillor here in Gauteng for a long time, before he became a member of the government. And when I talk like this, I'm not talking about bringing in people that you don't know and imposing them on you. We're talking about placing people like you in municipal councils as representatives of the IFP. If you create a partnership now and work together to grow the IFP in China, we'll secure votes for the IFP in 2016 that enable us to put IFP people in positions of influence. Friends, I hope that when I talk about IFP people, I'm talking about you. There's much that you can do to, to send the IFP in Gauteng. It is not simply about voting to the IFP. It's about actively promoting Southwest voice of reason, mobilizing support, and perhaps most fundamental, enabling the creation of party structures in China that will allow people to become politically active in IFP branches. Setting up branches means mobilizing people and bringing them together around a shared vision. <coughs> and I needn't tell you, season people like yourselves, that this costs money. And one of the greatest challenges our party faces is lack of resources. The ruling party not only has more resources than we have, and we can ever dream of, but if the state resources are used, you know that this is an election, the Minister of Social Development goes out to give people persons of food even to buy support from them. We don't have resources which the bigger parties such as the DA and the NC have. But we do have, what we have is individual patriots committing themselves to intervene on behalf of our country by supporting those with courage and integrity. To stand up and say no. My son is here and I will talk one day and I remember him saying to me, quoting someone, that if one is, has integrity, then not anything else doesn't matter. The sad part of it is this. That we cannot say that elections in South Africa have been free and fair since then. I can quote many instances. But the latest one is more important. We have complained about the fact that Members of the teachers' organization called South African Democratic Teachers Union, SATU, are affiliated to COSAT. And during campaigns, they, they campaign for the ANC. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've been in this restaurant many times. I know the Kizen is wonderful. I don't want you next time, Mr. 
I say he invites you and invites me that you'll say your oh, order, is it? No, long-winded old man came who, who actually spoiled our appetite. By the time we ate, our appetite was gone. I believe that we are like-minded on this. There's something constructive needs to be done. I'm grateful for the opportunity together as friends to bring bread together and to share ideas of what can be done through a partnership between us. And I would like to apologize also for having arrived later than self. That was because, in fact, we were delayed by the traffic in Johannesburg. I didn't know that the traffic was so heavy even during the evening in Johannesburg. I want to apologize for that because I would have suggested to our host that maybe for 15 minutes I should stand here that if anyone wants to raise any question about anything under the sun, I would prefer to answer it. But I don't know if that will not uh, end the coronary section of this.